Thank you and good morning. Uh, I'd just like to start the slides with the first safety moment that we had at Gatwick. Um, some of you may be aware, but on Thursday the 21st of July 2022, we had a, a fatal um, incident on the site. A, one of our colleagues on the Gatwick Station project um, sadly lost his life. Um, it was due to a lifting operation out on site. Um, a normal sort of lifting operation, a piece of steel, half a tonne, got snagged um, on the airport concourse deck and unfortunately the crane continued, the tower crane continued to uh, lift that piece of steel and the, 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 the sling strop, in effect it snapped and it crushed the operative. Um, we're working with the HSE and the, the, the British Transport Police in terms of coming to a, a close on it. Um, all our lifting operations are currently under, under review in terms of the amount of operations that we carry out. But yeah, um, I just wanted to start with that, just to um, let you know the things that were happening at Gatwick. We're a site, we've been started since 2019, the Gatwick Station project. It is um, a development of the actual station itself. Um, it's a heavy civils project itself. It's remodelling platforms three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, we've got the main airport sort of concourse area, as you can see on the top. Um, it's the the idea of it is as you tend into Gatwick Station itself, coming down from the airport concourse down to platform level. Um, there's a lot of congestion in the platform itself. So the actual aim of the project is to take that congestion sort of at the upper sort of concourse level and it redirects the passengers that come in from the plane down to the um, track or down to the platform level in a more easy, easier fashion itself. Um, we are working er sort of in the whole sort of area of the Gatwick Airport area itself. So the station entrance, there's platform seven, there's a lot of back of house facilities that we're remodeling we're as well. Um, and as part of that, um, there is a sort of a, a track scope added to that in terms of uh, some of the layout areas that need to be remodelled. Um, the platform itself is going to be extended um, and that's meant uh, track remodelling changes, signalling changes associated. Um, these are conduct rail changes as well. So Gatwick station project itself, um, over the next couple of slides, I'm sort of going to give you an overview to sort of bring the concept in your head um, and then go for the actual challenges and the lessons that we learnt across the project. So in itself, it's part of a, a bigger scheme, the Brighton Mainline Upgrade Programme Scheme. And that consists of a series of interventions across the Victoria to Brighton route. So as you've seen with COVID levels, uh, the, the general purpose of travel along this route is becoming leisure. Um, and part of that is to uh, make this a, an easier route to get a faster route from London to Brighton, Brighton to London. Um, in doing so, we've carried out some feasibility works. There, there is some sort of main infrastructure interventions to be carried out along the route itself. And one of those that was key was at Gatwick itself. So whilst we were carrying out work at Gatwick in terms of the station and airport concourse solution, we've also looked at the track elements and see, seeing how we can tie that in with the works that happen in, in as part of this Brighton Mainland Upgrade programme. So as you can see in the blue, um, there is a considerable amount of scope that was detailed as under the Gatwick Station project. And then in, in the red, under stage B, you can see there is a considerable extra bit of scope as well um, as part of this Brighton Mainland Upgrade programme. The headline benefit for this was that it improves the journey time by five minutes for passengers in and out of Gatwick. It also provides other benefits in terms of flexibility coming off the down fast, which is on the on the left hand side of the of the of the layout. As it comes into platforms six and seven, it takes it off the main down fast route itself, and that allows a, a, a let passengers to disembark the train with their luggage to keep the network free for movements down towards Brighton. So in terms of where we was at in the original scope, I just wanted to just sort of bring a sort of a high level understanding in terms of as we've gone through the initial development of Gatwick from a station project, a civils led project, to uh, what's now become a, a track remodelling project itself. 
So the initial scope, as you can see, was because we extended that platform six, we had 360 metres of plane line, an NR60D crossover to be installed, uh, a wrap um, um, in the area to facilitate the changes of that uh, 360 metres of plane line. Again, as I said, it is a civils-led project. Suddenly, we've got all of this uh, uh, scope brought in in terms of track um, to be delivered. As I said before, we started in 2019. This scope was added in 2021 in the blue. So we can see there's a significant amount of play line works, a significant amount of, uh, well, double the amount of SNC. We've got the two NR60 layouts at either end of the site. That ties into the, to the down platform loop itself. So we've got an NR60F that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, the turnout, and an NR60F on the, the right-hand side. So even selection of the switches and things like that as part of our early feasibility was looking at keeping a standard set of SNC through the area. We have reduced the speed through the area. It was a 90-mile-an-hour railway through Gatwick. We've reduced it down to 50 by putting in these NR60F switches, but the idea is that it removes that bottleneck of train stopping on, on the main route, we can just route them uh, f uh, as efficiently as possible into platforms six and seven so that the passengers can get their ways up to the airport concourse level itself. So with that increase in scope, obviously there's a, a SIGLIN, there's an ETE, there's, there's, there's quite a few other elements that are associated with that. So I'm just gonna focus on the track elements today. Uh, and as I said before, this was all instructed at the back end of 2021. So to get us to here today to where we are, we've had to work under uh, a new standard that's come out in terms of working under the principles of PACE and some of the lessons and things like that that we'll go through later, um, we can hopefully can take away and um, on other projects that you may work on. Uh, so just going left to right, I just had a couple of photos on there just to give you guys a bit of context in terms of what the, uh, I think it's, it serves a bit of purpose in looking at a diagram. So at that left-hand side of the diagram that you saw earlier um, as the London end, um, this is what Gatwick looked like um, prior to starting the main sort of remodeling stages. So as you can see, there's a signal gantry um, on the, on the right-hand side. We had to cut back, um, and that's the photo of it um, being removed um, effectively six months later in terms of work from early concept design all the way through to installing the NR60 um, F-switch um, turnout at the at the London end. So the next photo we've got, um, as you saw in, uh, in that diagram, was the central section, the platform six section. So that's the, the crux of the works in terms of the, the, the platform itself. There was um, uh, uh, formerly a track in that area. It was a, a bullhead um, track on wood sleepers that we removed and we've now replaced with a track on a new alignment through that section, and there's a new platform um, currently being constructed um, and planned to be entered into service um, at Christmas. <coughs> and then again, at the country end, on the right-hand side of that diagram that we saw earlier, uh, there was a, a new track alignment that had to be installed, as you can see in between the, the six foot there, um, and then we've got the 1715 uh, Alpha Bravo crossover, the NR60D switch, these are Mark II um, layouts, and right in the, further, in the distance, there's the 1714's NR60F switch. So that's it now installed. That was installed in August. As you can see, we've been quite busy over the past year. So we've come across a lot of challenges along the way, um, and I just wanted to focus on the top sort of three challenges um, that we've had over the past um, in, in the project as we've developed since 2019 um, and hopefully um, people will be able to take away um, or share some share some of the stories and uh, uh, share some with pain and some are good sort of practices which I think I'll take forward um, going on to other projects as well. So the first one was in April week four in 2020 uh, this year sorry um, we installed that um, SNC on the left-hand side of that diagram that we saw earlier, 17, 13 points. It was an NR60F switch, as I said before. Um, it was installed during a 52-hour weekend. Um, things didn't go to plan over the weekend. Um, we had a weld failure over the weekend. Um, we had a, a run out of the weld. 
in the layout itself. Um, and as a result, um, at the time of handback, there was a, a, a air gap in the rail, effectively. On the weekend itself, we deemed that not uh, a major issue, that we'll capture it um, midweek in the nights because it was on an out-of-use line itself. So whilst Platform 6 has still been redeveloped, we thought that there wasn't going to be an issue having a failed well. So the possession was handed back Monday morning, service running as normal. Carried on um, through midweek as usual, uh, completed the, 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 the welding process. Um, we had to install a closure rail where that failed weld was. And during that installation of that, um, that, failed, that, that closure rail to remove that failed weld, um, upon handback, um, the track was shown um, occupied when it was actually clear. So there was a lot of head scratching on the Friday morning um, that day. Um, so we had quite a significant amount of delay minutes associated with it. When in fact, what had been identified was there should have been two IBJs installed in that SNC. So there's an IBJ A and an IBJ B. The IBJ A that you can see in the diagram was actually the uh, result in IBJ that was causing the track to show occupied when it should have been clear. So what we put this down to, um, the root cause of this, there was, a, there was a number of contributory factors leading up to this, which I'll go through as well, but the root cause of this was design integration. So at the early onset of the design, um, we had a signaling design. It wasn't at AFC. We IDC'd um, the track design and the signaling design together. There were IBJs that were listed within the signaling design on the bonding plan and throughout the layout. Uh, throughout the, 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 the track area, there wasn't any shown on the actual um, SNC unit itself. Unfortunately, this was picked up as part of the IDC um, and it was continued through, so no IBJ, IBJs were shown, and the track itself, um, the track SNC, was uh, manufactured without the IBJs as a result. And the track was taken to AFC while the signaling design was still going through its final um, AFC process. So another contributory factor as a result of us not having the IBJs installed within the SNC turnout itself. So when we review the REPW joins, they, as, a, as a standard, they show the um, IBJs um, located within the actual SNC unit itself. But because the, um, the, the bonding plan didn't pick that up at the, at the onset, it was missed and it continued through the design process. There was other constraints that we had along the way um, one of them was the manufacturing of the SNC layout itself. We had eight revisions of the uh, manufacturing drawings themselves. There was quite a bit of focus on how the SNC units were, were delivered to site. So we was looking at um, initially um, bringing down as a modular layout, um, but through uh, route requirements, um, we've gone down a non-modular layout. So through the manufacturing process, we went through an iteration of having a modular layout into a non-modular layout. And then we had to have the challenge of actually bringing the layout down to site. So we, in effect, brought the layout down as a modular layout with uh, one in three bearers <coughs> removed and rebuilt out on site itself um, with the full bearers installed before the actual crossing panels themselves were installed in the ground. Another, what we believe is a contributory factor, um, is the inspection that we do in the yards. So now there is a, there's no requirement to go up into the yard to inspect your SNC as part of, um, as, as a contractor. So one of the lessons that we've definitely learned is that we will always go up to the yards now to inspect our SNCs. We'll take the, our, our signaling team with us. Generally, the SNC is inspected against, again, that REPW join but we should really be taking bonded plans, and that's something that we'll take forward as well, is that things like block joints and um, are picked up or any other signaling or ETE assets as well, for that uh, fact as well, things like pots and, um, um, and any other features within the layout. As I said before, it's not normally a requirement to go down to inspect the SNC from the contractor side, but um, it's definitely, there is definitely benefits in terms of looking at how that SNC has been built 
and replicating that back down on the ground um, as, as the builder itself. So another contributory factor on that weekend four, we had four hours of a delay at the start of the possession. And this was due to a, a hook switch was welded on um, and we was unable to um, free it. So the isolation took a lot longer than normal to take. So the possession itself didn't start, the, the work site didn't start until four hours, it was four hours down on the program. So we progressed the program through the weekend and we caught back with the program, but there was a lot of things that um, had to get shifted around resource plans, uh, moved where we was having signaling, testing um, and uh, duties being carried out. There was moved to a night shift. Um, a lot of things had to be moved around and through the program, the change management was reliant on certain key people within um, their different disciplines, but we really needed to bring everyone sort of a little bit away from, bringing people away from site so that they can have a decision made in a controlled manner to look at things like, oh, if there's uh, wells not undertaken, if they're bonded out, um, and making that assessment on site in a, in a controlled manner. And then the, the next sort of main contributory factor as well, which we've identified was the bonding plan inspection as well, um, in effect on site. So as part of the signaling um, team, they go out and tick off what's been installed on site. So uh, there were IBJs that were ticked off um, on site to say that they were installed at the time. So there were talks about in terms of between shifts, because there was two people as the weekend progressed where the signaling team on day shift had to pass on to the night shift. So this was ticked off by two testers themselves. Um, they picked up um, uh, an IBJ and ticked it off, but they were assuming that that IBJ, was, that well that was created was gonna be um, uh, installed at a later time. So th th there are a lot of factors that are involved, but again, the root cause for it was the design integration. But it sort of brings you back to that classic model, the James Reason model in terms of, we, we did have a, the root cause being down as the, the well failure, um, uh, sorry, as the, it's the integration of the design at the earlier stages, but compounded by a well failure um, on the SNC itself, um, compounded by um, not having uh, an SNT team checking the SNT in the yard for um, IBJs, compounded by the SNT team as well, not checking on site in terms of the actual location of the, the IBJ. Um, all the, all the, the barriers sort of lined up and it allowed this fault to go all the way through. So one of the core sort of lessons to take away is, as I said from the beginning, in terms of trying to give you the context from the Gatwick station project, it was a very heavy civils led project. There's a lot of stuff going on with the actual main airport concourse itself. So the team, in effect, it was set up, as you can see in the green, that green sort of blob that's sort of trying to highlight, that is the core sort of stage, stations, airport sort of concourse team. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background with liaising with um, the Gatwick Airport themselves, the, tra uh, the train operators and things in the area. The, the, the blob in the blue, from the early onset was that same sort of team that was in there. So we had one CEM, that's one of the things that we're looking at is when, it, when we do get change in terms of a project under pace, we need to look at our resources as well and start looking at how we manage that engineering and that assurance throughout. So that was one of the core sort of lessons that we picked up when working under the principles of pace. So taking on to the next uh, lessons learned, um, so after that failure, we left an air gap in that rail um, because um, we said we, were, we took the project back into a design and an IDR state, effectively, an IDC, IDR state. So we took it all the way back, even though we had AFC designs to complete the job to completion, we took everything back and started again back in sort of April, May. Um, and as a result, we said the immediate action to that IPJ, the, the emission of the IPJ, the immediate action that we said we'd do was that we'd leave it as an air gap till we review all our, our designs and make sure that they're, they're fully integrated. So come to second hit to install the IBJ. Um, we installed the IBJ um, in, on the 31st of October, um, handed it back, two trains run across that IBJ, that very same IBJ, and we were hit with uh, another uh, track circuit failure. Um, and that was a full day in terms of uh, 
a track circuit failure on the network. And we were scratching our heads trying to find out what the issue was. In effect, it was the use, well, the, the IBJ that was installed, that was never part of the manufacturing supply that was installed after, went through an IDR process, an IDC process, put in the ground, and it was off center in terms of the position within the, the SNC bearers, the beds themselves. As a result, um, you can see here, there's a fastening that's touching the actual IBJ itself on either side of the IBJ, and it was making contact, bridging that IBJ and creating a, a track circuit fault. So the, uh, the first photo that you can see, this was at the incident. The, f the first error here is that there's a missing, it's the, it's the incorrect type of clip that's been used around IBJs in NR6 layouts. So that is one lesson that we've uh, picked up as well, that you need to be mindful of that. And it's the same with the maintenance team as well, that we, these are, this is an SKL21 clip that's used throughout the layout itself. And there's another type of fastening system, which is the SKL14, which is used around IBJs. They're slightly flatter and they fit within the, the recess that's within the six hole glued IBJ position itself. So this is just a, another photo just to show at first glance, until you do your, your measurements on site, it's slightly off center, but that was just enough for it to make contact on that IBJ and cause a, the track circuit fault didn't happen straight away. So it was tested back in and it was fine. But after the passage of two trains, we believe that the, the, the paint um, after a bit of vibration, even though it wasn't on the operational line itself, um, that um, the vibration within on the railways, the passage of two trains have gone through, they caused that track circuit failure. So again, there's a, another photo in terms of it, it wasn't very apparent on the day um, when it was installed. Again, um, it's just something that you need to be mindful of when installing the NR60 outs with the, with the IBJs. Normally, around these sort of IBJs, if you're using a, a fast clip type, it has the, the nylon insert on there, so that provides that protection. Um, we do have, I mean, the NR60 layouts, Mark II layouts have been around since 2017, but we still have in, 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 in our project world, uh, 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 we're still building on experience and competence in delivering these. We don't deliver these day in and day out, but when we do, we need to make sure that all of these kind of lessons are picked up and um, captured so that we don't repeat. So it's a fairly simple lesson to learn on this one was that use the, the right one, make sure the, the IBJ is positioned centrally within the bed. Um, there's not a lot of tolerance on that IBJ. And the second one is to make sure that you're aware that there is an SKL 14 fastening, which is, the, which is typically seen as black um, fasting that should be used in these layouts. Um, so the final sort of lessons learned is a bit more of a positive lessons learned that we've worked uh, a bit more collaboratively with the NetRail SNC quality inspection team. Um, so as I said before, Gatwick is the, the second busiest airport in the UK. Um, so that drives how we uh, deliver the SNC um, in in Gatwick itself, so road deliveries are a no-no. Um, but one of the things that we had to um, effectively look at is, as I said before, bringing it down on tilt and wagons with the switches, but then bringing down the actual crossing panels themselves um, as a uh, modular layout, um, and then replacing that modular layout with a full length bearers on site before they're installed. So we had two Kirovs out um, doing that on the, over the weekend. One was installing a switch, and one was um, re rebuilding effectively the, the wider seven meter crossing panels on the, on the F switches. So as a result, um, they're, they're installed, but they're not in use. So we've picked up quite a few uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of defects effectively. Um, and we've, we've sort of written a work and practice guidance document on that to help out with the project team as well as the maintenance team themselves. So along the Southern region, our maintenance team haven't had the formal training for the NR16 Mark II layouts. So we've worked together very collaboratively as well with the NR60 um, SNC specialist, um, that's Mark Barker Mills, um, that we worked with to come up with a couple of sort of things that we've picked up along the way that we, we make sure the guys on the ground uh, have picked up as well. So one of them was, um, again, back down on the clips. 
Um, in the green, you can see that the SKL21 fastening itself is installed the wrong way around. The tongue itself should be installed on the rail. So it's a, it's a basic thing, just telling the guys, especially when they carry out stressing operations and things like that on key in it, just making or un, unfastening it. They shouldn't be taking it fully off, but around welds as well, they, they remove the, the, the fastening, but they don't put it back in the, in the right fashion. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see um, there's a slightly different type of fastening. This is the SKL24 fastening. Um, there's, a, there's a blue variant and the red variant. Um, these are um, slightly different. They're used in the base-plated areas, and they consist of a T-bolt. Now, again, as you're walking through, I've only picked this up from walking through with the NOS SNC inspector, but again, as you're carrying out stressing operations, when you're talking these fastenings back down, if you're not holding the, the tool perpendicular to the rail, the fastening can be talked at an angle, which would create a point load on that T-bolt. So it's again having that knowledge and picking it up and sending it to telling one of the guys on ground and they'll, they'll pick it up as they go. Another one that we've seen a lot as well is the installation on the direct fix areas, the, the, the pads that go underneath the rail. They have the inclination within the pad, especially after welding. We've noticed that where the welders have removed the pads, they haven't put the inclination the right way. So we've got the, the, the inclination facing the wrong way, which can, again, lead to faults and lead to um, reducing the asset life as well in the area. So these, these are all very little things, but you, you, you tell a couple of guys on the, on the ground once and they pick it up and then they take it away with them. Another one that we've um, picked up as well is um, setting a detection on the Embera clamp lock. This is the Mark III Embera clamp lock. Um, we're setting it with the, the H gauges. Um, when you loosen it off and you put it within the actual detector blade itself, it may not sit perfect. Um, and that will cause you to not pick up detection, but just having get, just pressing down on the on the on the detection blade itself, um, or striking it with a, a rubber mallet, it would it will provide in most cases with the five mil or the three and a half millimeter um, H gauge, you'll pick up your detection back again. If you don't do that and you start thinking that oh you need to start chasing the detection out of that um, unit, you could be there for hours trying to um, pick it back up again. Uh, another one that we've found is the angle of the switchblade. You can see on here, this was in the yard, um, but again, um, replicating, that's what I'm saying, it's the, the key going up inside. You can see how the, the NR um, inspector team works with it and how they can, you can take this understanding back on the ground, is setting up the rollers. You can see the angle of the switchblade at the backs is moving a lot quicker than what the fronts is, and this is causing an angle in the, in the switch. And this... Uh, prevents the Embera clamp lock from unlocking. So just a simple thing like lowering down the rollers, taking off the weight um, off, the, off the back, so it allows to, uh, uh, sorry, put more weight on the back, so it allows the, the back to move at the same time as the fronts. It will allow the Embera clamp lock itself to unlock. Um, and as a result, um, we've created a, a working practice guidance for, again, as I said before, with our, with our, with our project team and with the maintenance team that we'll, we'll take forward. Um, so, yeah, the, the three top lessons learned that I can give you to take away today, um, if it's of benefit, and hopefully it is for the future SNC or renewals on the NR60 Mark II layouts, is if coordination of the design when working under pace, um, IBJ um, checks again on that SKL um, 14, um, and checking the IBJ set central to the bed. And finally, uh, the familiarity around the NR60 Mark II. So where we're not continually doing uh, renewals with NR60 Mark IIs is just picking up that level of familiarity and you can um, pick these a lot earlier and make sure that the asset stays more reliable when it's handed back into service. So thank you for today. Um, and that's all I've got for you today.